Hey, DSL and Builders, it's good to be hanging out with you today. Today, we begin message nine of this You Pick series that you've been involved in, that you decided that you wanted us to preach upon this summer. And so you've done a really good job of that. And I've heard some great feedback about how you've enjoyed the messages and how they've challenged you. I love it when we hear the word of God and it challenges us. So today we begin message number nine. I got a card that said this, James, would you preach a message on the new command found in John, found in John um, 13 verses 34 and 35, loving others in the family of God, especially as well as outside of the family of God and the way that God in Christ Jesus loved us. Let, let me just start with the problem. The problem is this. We have a really interesting dynamic when it comes to the love thing. I mean, if you look at the news, if you scan social media, if you hear our conversations, if you hear our political dialogue these days, if you take some time to check out the news, you would, you would understand that our culture has a problem with the love thing. Uh, we, and one of the problems is it's so hard because we only have one word for love, right? So we love chips and dips, right? We love home decor. We love uh, sports teams. You know, we love uh, our, the stuff, the way, what we wear, like our fashion. We love so many things. The other problem I think we have <laughs> when it comes to love is that uh, we don't like things that aren't like us. And so especially during these days, when we have someone that's different than us, when we have someone who thinks or looks or acts different than us, we have a problem loving one another. So, you know, we love when we agree, but when we disagree, eh, we love when we see the eye to eye, eye to eye, but if someone sees something different than us and, you know, we love each other when we're a part of the same tribe, a part of the same church, part of the same family, have the same beliefs, the same opinions, viewpoints, backgrounds, candidate, church body. But if it's different, we have the hardest time loving, even in the body of Christ. The body where we're called to love one another, we struggle with this mandate to love each other as we have been loved in Christ Jesus. You may be familiar with the name Tertullian. I, I don't know anyone who has named their child after him. Tertullian lived and ministered in the early uh, days of the third century AD. He was one of the greatest of the early church fathers and was actually the first person to, to kind of coin the word Trinity to describe the nature of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He lived in a wrote in a time when there was great opposition to the church, the way, and Christianity, and that opposition was intensifying. Although Tertullian was an apologist, meaning he devoted himself to defending and defining the Christian faith against his critics, he was, point, he was quick to point out that it wasn't a particular theological or philosophical argument that would ultimately persuade non-believers, non-followers of the truth of Jesus. Rather, it was seemingly an uh, inexplicable love the Christians had for one another that kind of baffled the people who looked at them. The people who were watching them were baffled by the love they had for each other. And, and, and this love captivated non-Christians in a way that it prompted Tertullian to say this, it is mainly the deeds of a love so noble that leads many to put a brand upon us. See, they say, see how they love one another, how they are ready even to die for one another. No tragedy causes trouble in our brotherhood and the family possessions, which generally destroy brotherhoods among you, create fraternal bonds among us. One in mind and soul, we do not hesitate to share our earthly goods with one another. All things are in common except our wives. I, I love that, right? 
I mean, can we honestly say the same thing today? Can we honestly say that people look at us in the church, the brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, the belongers, and say, look how they love one another. Look how they have everything in common. One of the things that we see in our culture today is the church is splitting at the seams. We have people who are pro that and con that, and the church seems to be splitting. I, I wish we could say today, as uh, Tertullian was saying back in those early days of Christianity, that we have one, we have everything in common. I don't think our love for one another is quite the same as it was in those early days. Listen how some of the great citizens of our society, past and present, define love. It's just a little bit different than the way Tertullian would have defined it. Andrew Lloyd Webber, composer of many Broadway plays and musicals, is quoted as saying, love changes everything, how you live and how you die. From the inspirational Broadway musical, one of my favorite, Les Miserables, comes this line, to love another person is to see the face of God. In the movie about the life of Mahatma Gandhi, when he lies almost dead from his hunger strike to stop the war or the killing among the Muslims and Hindus, this, he shares this. When I despair, I remember that all through history, the way of truth and love is always one. There have been tyrants and murderers for a time. They always seem invisible, but in the end, they always fail. Always. The famous English writer Chesterton once wrote, it's, it is not that Christianity has been tried and found boring, it, has, it is that it has been tried and found difficult. So Jesus gave his followers, and thus us who are following in 2024, a new command as he began to end his ministry. Jesus instructed that our love for others should be modeled after his love for us. In other words, love others in the way that I have loved you, said Jesus today. So we come today to one of the most famous declarations that ever move out of the lips of Christ. And yet, though, it's recognized. I mean, if I if we talk about it in the church, if you're a believer and a belonger and a becomer, you know this. You can even quote it by heart. But I wonder how faithful we've been in putting into practice John 13, 34 through 35. Listen to Jesus's new command. Let me give you a new command. Love one another the same way I loved you. You're, you love one another. This is how everyone, hear this again. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples when they see the love that you have for each other. Before I dive into this, I want you to notice something that Jesus says. Our responsibility to love one another is a commandment. This is not, this is not one suggestion. This is not some good advice. This is not one of many options that we can choose from. Jesus is commanding us to do something. We're subject to the authority of Jesus Christ. When we say that Jesus is Lord of our lives, it means that we're subject to his authority. We're not the master of our own lives. We're not free to live any way we please when we say Jesus is Lord. In fact, he will later declare that obedience is how we know. Obedience is how we know if one is genuinely believes in Jesus and truly loves Jesus. Listen to it. He says later on John 14, 13. If you love me, show it by doing what I tell you. In John 15, he says this, you are my friends when you do the things I command you. Jesus isn't saying that by keeping his commands, you receive salvation. What he's saying is the proof of your salvation is how you and I keep his commands. The commandment of God uh, that people are to love one another, that's not new. I mean, that's not new, but way back in the First Testament, we are told in Leviticus that we are to love one another. Listen to Leviticus 19, verses 17 to 18. I mean, back in the, and when God is calling his people to himself, he begins to talk about this. 
He says in Leviticus, don't secretly hate your neighbor. If you have something against him, get it out into the open. Otherwise, you are accomplice in his guilt. Don't seek revenge or carry a grudge against any of your people. Love your neighbor as yourself. I am God. In other words, he's saying is, he is a, I'm God. I'm saying to you, love your neighbor as yourself. Clearly, I believe the newness of this command isn't because it says that we should love someone. It is instead the pattern or the, the, the new model and how we are to love them. It is the way that we're called to love that is totally new because Jesus, or what Jesus did by, by moving into the neighborhood. So, so God shows up in the hood, right? And he, and he dies on the cross for our sins, our, our messed up self-centeredness. And, and he comes and, and he dies for us so that we could live forever. Yes, love was a command way before God moved into the neighborhood through Christ. Way before he got up on Sunday morning from the cross and raised, was raised from the dead. But, but what he's saying here is that this new command to love others, not as I love myself, the golden rule. I like to call it the titanium rule. Love others the way God in Christ Jesus has loved you. So we're going to follow God's command. If we're going to follow the command of Jesus, we have got to look at how Jesus loved one another. So here's the question. How did Jesus love his disciples? I mean, if, God, if Jesus says, love others the way I loved you, then it would be smart for us to go and see how Jesus loved his disciples. The 12 that he put together, the ones that he called to be part of his team. So let's hang out in the gospel letters of the New Testament to find out how Jesus loved others. First, he loved, he loved them by spending time with them. In Mark 3, it, where he's calling his disciples, we read this. He settled them 12 and designated them apostles. The plan was that they would be with him and he was sending them out to proclaim the word and give authority to banish demons. Note this phrase, that, that they would be with him. He spent time with them. Jesus didn't call the 12 and commission them into ministry and then kind of retreat and go off and hang out with someone else or go off and kind of do the prayer thing or go off and just kind of isolate himself. No, he hung out with them. He went with them. So they watched how he did it. They listened to what he said, and they enjoyed time with him. Secondly, he loved his own. He loved them by being patient with their struggles, their stumbles, and their stupidity. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine moving into the neighborhood, moving in, into the neighborhood, being God, the God man moving into the neighborhood, calling these 12 guys together who were never prepared. They weren't prepared for leadership when he called them. But Jesus is committed to helping them grow up spiritually. So he deals with their struggles, their stumbles, their stupidity. He didn't let his own frustrations with their immaturity undermine his determination to love them well. Let's look at some examples. At one point, several of them got into the argument about who was the greatest. I mean, you know, Jesus is getting ready to die, and they're, they're talking about who's the greatest. And Luke 9, instead of taking their cues from Jesus, instead of learning from his humility, instead of learning from him, they become competitive. They play one-upsmanship games, asking who would sit next to Jesus, who was the most important and Jesus gives them this statement, for he who is least among you of all is the one who is great. On another occasion, after Jesus has been rejected by the Samaritan, James and John asked Jesus, Master, do you want us to call down a boat of lightning and strike, up, strike them dead? And Jesus says, of course not. You know what? They were immature. They were immature. But Jesus did not did not walk away from them. He, he stayed with them. He was committed to them. 
Jesus was motivated by love and the desire that they would learn from their mistakes. If that wasn't crazy enough, on the part of James and John, on one occasion, they, they went to their mom and they asked their mom to go to Jesus and, and ask Jesus if one of them could sit on their, his right and the other on his left. I mean, I mean, this is, this is great, right? Go to mom and say, hey, mom, can you go to Jesus and ask, can we have the prime spots? When the other disciples heard this, they got really angry, but not Jesus. Jesus just said, whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. And, and we're not even going to get into Peter, who is constantly putting his foot in his mouth, who is constantly speaking before he thought. You know, Peter, who denied him three times. along with the rest of the disciples when they got scared. No, Jesus stuck with them. The third way he loves them is by persevering through thick and thin and not allowing their faults and their failures to sour his love for them. We saw already in John 13, 1, having loved his dear companions, he loved them to the very end. There was nothing that could get them to turn on, to Jesus to turn on them. There was nothing that could that could get Jesus to walk away from them. Fourth, he loved them by teaching them truth, even when it might be hard for them to grasp, even when they didn't like it. Hear me now. He never hid things from them, but clearly instructed them on what being a follower of him would entail, persecution, slander, imprisonment, rejection, and even their very lives. Our world today has a terrible problem with love. And here's how the problem manifests itself. They think they know what it means. The standard definition of love is that you never do or say anything that might be upsetting or offensive to another person. You never do or say anything that might get in the way of expressing their own personal desires in however they choose to, to love someone in the world's eyes is to affirm or approve whatever they believe about themselves or choose to do with their body, their money, their lives as a whole. In our world, it is virtually impossible to say you're wrong, but you're still loved. Can you hear what I'm saying to you? In our world today, if you say you're wrong, then someone's going to say you don't love me. If you say I don't agree with you, they're going to say you don't love me. To tell someone that they're wrong, they're misguided, they're in danger, they're in a process of destroying their lives both for now and then for eternity is to hate them. To love them is to give them unqualified, unconditional approval or affirmation. Jesus never did that. He always spoke and acted with the best interests of his people in mind. And often the best interests are served only by his speak, him speaking the harsh thing, the harsh truths, even if they didn't want to hear it. And John 3, 3 says this, Take it from me, unless a person is born above, it's impossible to see what I'm pointing to, God's kingdom. And John 3, 18, he says this, Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust him has long been under the death sense as well knowing. And then why? Because of the person's failure to believe in the one of kind son of God when introduced to him. Now take that and throw it against the wall of all roads lead to God. Jesus said, no, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. Jesus said in John 3.36, that is why whoever accepts and trusts in the Son gets in on everything, life complete and forever. And that is why also the person who avoids and distrusts the Son is in dark and doesn't see life. All he experiences God is darkness and an angry darkness at that. He went on in John 8, 24 to say this, If you won't believe I am who I say I am, you're at a dead end of sin. You're missing God in your lives. And he just went on and on and on saying to them, hey, let me just give you the truth. The truth is always do not lead to God. The truth is that your best, you're living your best, is living in response to the grace of Christ in your life. That's the best. 
He said one day to a group of Pharisees and teachers of law, if God was your father, said Jesus, you would love me for I came from God and I arrived here. I didn't come on my own. And then he says, he sent me. You are from your father, the devil, and all you want to do is to do what pleases him. Why did Jesus say stuff like this? Why was Jesus so kind of really rough in his conversation? He said it to them out of love. He said it to them because they are true and apart from faith in him. People stand in jeopardy of eternal, eternal separation from God. Fifth, he loved them by consistently praying for them. In fact, the entire chapter of 17 of John's gospel, the final, the final kind of uh, summation of Jesus' time with his disciples, he says, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the God-rejecting world, but for those you gave me, for they are yours by right. Six, this is what he did. He loved them by making known the Father to them. And John 17, 26, it says this, I have made your very being known to them who you are and what you do and continue to make it known so that your love for me might be in them exactly as I am in them. Jesus, Jesus consistently modeled love for us to follow. I also love that this, uh, this love, this, this mandate of this new, this new commandment so transformed John. John, the one that called himself the love of God, the one who loved God, the one that loved Jesus, that John, that John that uh, is writing epistles, he's writing letters to churches and has so transformed him that this is, is so impacted him that he continued to he continued to live out that love and, and continue to encourage his small churches to live in that same love. Here's what he says. My dear friends, I'm not writing anything new here. This is the oldest commandment in the book. And you've known it from day one. It's always been implicit in the message you've heard. On the other hand, perhaps it is new, freshly minted, as it is in both Christ and you, the darkness is on its way out and the true life already blazes. John is saying that what makes this love new is not merely that we now have a new standard or pattern, but that we have new power. You are able to love others because of the power of Christ inside of you. In other words, when we love as Christ loved, we don't simply copy or imitate his love. We participate in it. He, his love in us and then through us on behalf of others. Our loving others is more than just a mere simulation simula of the love of Christ. It's a manifestation of that very love through power. Let me say it again so we don't, so we don't miss it here. It's not simply that Jesus is our pattern for how to love one another. There is a sense in which he and his father are also the power in how we love one another. Or to put it another way, loving others as Jesus loved us is not simply about following his example, but it is about expressing the power of God's Holy Spirit that enables us to love one another the way that, Christ, or the way that God in Christ Jesus loved us. Jesus said, by loving our brothers and sisters in Christ, we show the world that we're truly his followers, his followers, his disciples. But, but John goes even further. And, and, and he says that loving one another is a demonstration. It demonstrates that we are born again. Look, listen to what John says, 1 John 2, 9 through 11. Anyone who claims to live in God's light and hates a brother or sister is still in the dark. It's the person who loves the brother and sister who dwells in God's light and doesn't block the light out from others. But whoever hates is still in the dark, stumbles around in the dark, doesn't know which end is up, blinded by their darkness. Here's the deal. It's a joke to say that I'm walking in light. I'm walking in the light of Christ. And, I, and, and I'm walking. I'm, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of Christ. 
and hate others, Christians. That's not love. And that's not love at all. John is saying, you're, you're not. You're not a follower. So we, we often ask ourselves, how do I know if I'm a Christian? How do I know if I'm a Christian? Is it, is it merely by saying so? Is that good enough? Is it attending church faithfully? Is it serving? Is it giving? Is it praying regularly? Is that enough? John says, no, it's not what you say. It's not how often you attend church, although we love for you to be here. It's, how, it's not in how much you give. The proof that you and I are displaying authentic, authentic, sacrificial, Christ-like love for other believers. That's how we know if we're Christians. The presence of love for each other confirms the real thing. Listen to John once again. The way that we know we've been transferred from death to life is that we love our brothers and sisters. Anyone who doesn't love is as good as dead. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know very well that eternal life and murder don't go together. So let me ask you a question. Have you kind of worked this new command into your life? Have you you been able to work it into your life? How are you doing with this love thing? How are you doing with not loving people the way that people have loved you? Not a reciprocity kind of thing, but how are you doing in loving others and loving the people of God in the way Jesus loved you? So let's, let's end this with some practice. So how, do you, how can you begin, if you've not started, how can you begin to love others the way God in Christ Jesus loved you? You can love by forgiving each other as Christ forgave us. You know, sometimes we would we love to receive God's forgiveness, but when someone wrongs us, we kind of walk away from them and we don't want to forgive them. The Bible says that one of the ways we experience, we experience the forgiveness of God is by forgiving others. We love by serving others, one another, in humility as Christ dis- as Christ served his disciples, remember, at the end of Christ's life, he takes off his robe, he takes the hand towel, and he begins to wash his, his disciples' feet. And he says, what I have done for you, you do for each other. He says, I'm your master and Lord, and that's right. And if I, your master and Lord, can do this for others, so can you. We love by generously giving to those in need for my financial and and physical resources that when we see someone in need in the body of Christ that we we give to them we love by patiently dealing with each other's mistakes and immaturity you know here's the reality none of us became a Christian and became a super saint more than likely most of us became Christians and we were young and we were immature and we made mistakes and we did immature things, and we said immature things, and it took us some time to grow up. We love one another by patiently dealing with each other's mistakes and immaturity. We love by each other by deferring to one another in humility and seeking others' best interests over our own. Is not what Jesus did. Jesus leaves all of heaven. And he comes and moves into the neighborhood. And what does he do? He puts our interests over his own interests. Moving to the neighborhood meant that he was going to die on a cross, that he was going to, the one who had no sin was going to take on our sin. So how do we love the way that Christ loved us? We love by deferring to one another in humility. We love by speaking the truth in love, not by just hiding the truth or wanting to be liked or wanting people to pat us on the back, but we speak the truth in love. Now, I've heard people speak the truth and say it's in love in a very unloving way. That's not how Jesus does it. Jesus speaks the truth, and he does it because he wants the very best for us. We 
We love each other by refusing to isolate ourselves from community, from belonging. We realize that we're better together. So we join one another and we join in community because we're better together when we're in community. We're called to do so many things together. We're called to do so many things one to another in the body of Christ. It's the reason why our mission statement begins with we exist uh, to help the world, starting in our own neighborhoods and communities, to belong, to belong in community. You and I can't do it on our own. We have to do it together. We love by being willing to suffer inconveniences and interruptions to our schedule. If, if that is what is called for, to serve one another and to help encourage others. You know, sometimes times when my schedule gets interrupted, it's the best thing that happen is, happens in my day. Sometimes I often frust am frustrated by it and complain about it. But when it's all over, I discovered it's the best thing I've done that day. We love by not turning away from hating on people who are different than us. It's, it's, it's when they are different than us. It's when they are, they believe something different than us about what's going on in the stuff of the day. It's when that happens and we still love one another that the world is convinced that this Christianity thing really matters. Because if all, if all we love are those we get along with, those who are like us, those who, who go along with us, that's no different than anyone else. But it's when people are different. When we have differences and we still love one another. And we can put aside our differences, especially, especially what I call not, differences that theologically aren't that important. There's some theological differences that are, and doctrinal differences that are very important, but there's some that aren't that important. And we're called to love no matter those kind of differences. We love by trying at all times to, to keep the unity of the body together, to be unified with one another. And we love, last but not least, by praying for one another, by taking the time to just pray for one another. I could name a whole bunch of other ways that we keep this command to love others the way that God in Christ Jesus loved us. It's not, like I said, it's not just an option. It's not something that we can just choose to do. We're commanded to love one another. The new command, to love one another the way that God in Christ Jesus loved you. I call it the titanium rule. And when I think of how God in Christ Jesus loved me in my worst moments, in my most immature moments, in my moments where I did things that hurt the heart of God and the fact that he continued to love me in Christ Jesus, I can't not love others. I'm called to it. I'm drawn to it. And so... The new command is not a new, new command from the perspective that we're called to love. It's we don't love defined by our own terms. It's not how I define love. It's the way that God in Christ Jesus defined love and the way he loved his disciples and the way that he loved us when we were of no use whatsoever to him by dying on the cross. So let me ask you a question. How are you doing with that new command? Why don't you pray with me today? Father, we thank you. We thank you for the new command. We thank you for defining what it means to love in the body of Christ. We thank you, Father, that when we were no use whatsoever to you, Christ died for us. And he puts his love on full display by dying on the cross for us. And so, Father, when we take the time to really think about that, when we take the time to really process that, 
to allow that to work its way from our head to our heart. And we understand that we have no, we have no, no ability to approach your throne. No reason why you would love us, but you do anyway. It challenges us, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit to love other people. We can't do on our own. But in 1 John, John says that through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us, that we don't have to just imitate your love, but we can be empowered to be your love in the church and beyond. So, Father, would you help us today to, to really love others the way you've loved us? We've got to take you up on that love. And there are people who are listening to me today, people who are viewing this, this message today, who don't know your love through Christ Jesus because they've never allowed you to come into their hearts. Today, Father, I'm praying that they will take this opportunity to say, God, I accept you, that they would take the opportunity to, to, to experience the promise of John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever, that they would put their name in the blank of whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Father, there are people who need to pray that prayer today, and I pray that your Grace that goes before would lead them to a place of surrender and repentance and life. Now, Father, there are those of us who've been on the way a little while, and we have decided that we define what the love of God is for the body of Christ. That's not the way it works. So, Father, would you help us to examine the scriptures? Would you help us to, to, to know and understand the way that you love your disciples? and the people around you who are in the body? And would you help us to go and do likewise? Not as a suggestion, not as an option, but as a command, because you said those who love me will do what I command. So Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you help us out to live out this command so that the world wouldn't have to guess whether we're Christians, but they would see it by the way that we love one another. Because you say in your word, this is the way that all people will know that you are my followers, that you are my disciples, that you are the called out ones by the way you love one another. So Father, today, by the power of your Holy Spirit, by your reign and your rule in us, help us to love one another in such a way that that love would spill out of the church and spill out of the body of Christ. <laughs> and it would spill on to other people. And seeing it, they would bow their knee and bend their head and decide to follow you. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, thanks for hanging out today. Uh, we would love if you made the decision to hear about it. You can email me at jamesandsellingfields.com. I would love to hear about your decision, and we would love to help you take the next step, wherever you are. Maybe you're, living, you're somewhere in somewhere around the world. We would love to get you in a Bible-believing church. Maybe you're in another state, another state. We would love to get you in a Bible-believing church so you can take your next step. If you're here, and you're listening and you're in the community here around the greater Spotsylvania, kind of Fredericksburg area, we would love to help you take the next step in your love relationship with Jesus, the body of Christ, and the wide world. See you next week.